thank you, Matt, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Christina, Oliver, and Lionel for involving me in the organization of this incredible conference and for giving me a chance to receive feedback from some of the best scholars in the field. So thank you. Thank you, Lionel, especially for pushing me. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, as Matt indicated, my thesis focuses on the permit application process for mining companies looking to develop projects on ceded territory where Ojibwe tribes have reserved hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. I look at how tribes are involved in the permit application process and how they interact with state and federal agencies and to what degree their approval or opposition to a project may impact the delivery of the mining permit. I had the chance to travel to Wisconsin and Minnesota in May to conduct interviews with agencies and experts who work on topics related to my research, and I thought this conference was the perfect opportunity to discuss some of the findings and remarks that emerged from these interviews. During the interviews, both the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, or GLIFWIC, experts and Al Giddix, a, soci a sociology professor and anti-mining activist, brought up the importance of rural grassroots alliances that emerged in the state and the importance of that collaboration on the anti-mining movement and the overall relations between white rural communities and native communities. This led me to research the concept of place membership that I thought would be interesting to discuss with you. So what is place membership? Zoltan Grossman, a geographer and activist, defines place membership as a symbolic frame based on, and I quote, people living in a particular naturally or culturally significant place rather than within a particular political boundary, end quote. According to him, native, non-native environmental alliances can be attributed to people constructing a new identity based on their attachment to a place, hence place membership, rather than based on a common state citizenship. The concept is fairly new to my research, and I haven't done extensive research on place membership yet, but I thought this conference was the perfect opportunity to discuss the concept with you and listen to your perspectives on the idea that place membership could be an effective tool to create a sense of community because it relies on a tangible place and tangible natural resources rather than a complex and sometimes more abstract concept of citizenship. So in an article published in 2005, Grossman identifies four stages to place membership in rural areas. The first stage is the assertion of tribal sovereignty. The second stage is the conflict period that directly results from the assertion. The third stage is the dialogue phase. And the fourth stage is native, non-native collaboration to protect the shared place. In Wisconsin, the first stage was initiated by the arrest of Fred and Mike Tribble in 1974. The two brothers were members of the La Courterie tribe who had been arrested for poaching by Wisconsin game wardens. After learning about their reserved rights in an Indian law course, they had gone ice fishing off reservation on Chief Lake. And after an initial guilty conviction, tribal attorneys took over the case, arguing that the brothers were exercising their treaty protected rights. In 1983, Judge Dole ruled in favor of the tribe reaffirming Ojibwe reserved rights, and despite the case leading to further court proceedings to establish the scope of treaty rights, the ruling was sufficient enough to spark outrage in local white sport fishing communities who saw the reaffirmation as granting Ojibwe spare fishers special rights exempting them from state fishing regulations. The reaction to the Voight ruling constitutes the beginning of the second stage that saw the emergence of violent racist organizations that further divided the state between white rural sport fishers and native spare fishers. Two years after the ruling, Larry Peterson founded Protect Americans' Rights and Resources, an organization in keeping with the broader national anti-mining movement initiated by Citizens Equal Rights Alliance, whose objective was, and I quote, equal rights, environmental protection, and protecting the local tourism-based economy. Parr's rhetoric was based on unfounded and unscientific arguments that portrayed spare fishing as a damaging fishing practice that threatened the fish population and therefore threatened the tourism-based economy. The organization received the support of many local sport fishing associations and resort owners who relied on fishing for, as a revenue. 
Under the guise of environmental consciousness, the group discriminated against Ojibwe spearfishers and organized violent protests at boat landings around northern Wisconsin, where protesters yelled racial slurs and carried posters that read, Save a spawning walleye, spare a pregnant squaw. In 1987, PAR organized a two-day convention gathering delegates from 12 states that shared their views on indigenous treaty rights. A participant told the leader telegram, and I quote, I say a sad day in America has arrived on this 200th anniversary of our constitution, a day which allows a special class of citizens to have rights far exceeding all others without obligation or responsibility to America. Disagreements among protesters led to the emergence of a more radical group called Stop Treaty Abuse, presided by Dean Christ and funded by the sales revenue of a beer he named Treaty Beer. The anti-treaty movement in Wisconsin grew in popularity by successfully portraying reserved rights as discriminatory and as a threat to the local tourist economy. Parr often referenced Martin Luther King and apartheid South Africa claiming, the good people of northern Wisconsin will no longer accept being branded as racist because we share Martin Luther King's dream, a dream that how many fish a person can catch will be judged not by the color of his skin, but the strength of his fishing line. Any person who opposes apartheid South Africa but supports American Indian treaty rights is giving new meaning to the word hypocrisy. SCA leader Dean Chris marketed his treaty beer as the true brew of the working man, and by appealing to fears of economic decline, anti-treaty groups successfully rallied thousands of Wisconsinites who regularly gathered at boat landings to protest Ojibwe spearfishers. By 1989, the organization abandoned the environmental argument and openly expressed racist and extremely violent sentiments against Ojibwe tribe members. Many local shops hung threatening posters that read first annual Chippewa shoot and register kills with the DNR. And Dean Christ was quoted in the Milwaukee Sentinel when talking about KKK leader David Duke that, and I quote, he's saying the same stuff we've been saying like he might have been reading it from STA literature. By 1990, white northern Wisconsin was so deeply divided on the issue of Ojibwe treaty rights that a study conducted by the organization Witness for Nonviolence showed that 66% of residents of northern Wisconsin opposed Ojibwe spearfishing and reported 279 incidents of race-based violence. In 1991, the protest became so violent that a judge issued a permanent federal injunction prohibiting SCA and PAR members to interfere with sparing activities. Despite the violence of the boat landing protests, they actually constituted the first opportunity for many native and non-native Wisconsinites to engage in conversations regarding resource management and helped initiate the dialogue phase. In the 2005 article, Grossman indicates that the four stages can often overlap, and it was the case in Wisconsin with the conflict and the dialogue phase overlapping. In an interview, Witness for Nonviolence coordinator Deborah McNutt expressed her surprise at some of the conversations she heard between protesters and Ojibwe spearfishers who began to draw similarities in their attachment to the lakes and rivers of the region. The dialogue phase was, was facilitated thanks to the introduction of a common enemy, an outsider that helped bring together two communities who historically and culturally were seen as enemies. Prior to the spearfishing controversy and all throughout the 70s and the 80s, mining companies had started applying for metallic mining permits in the region where some of the largest zinc and copper deposits were found. Among these companies was Exxon Minerals, who had applied for a first permit with the DNR in 1975 and applied for a second permit in 1992. The Crandon Mine was located only a mile from the Socaugon Mole Lake wild rice beds and constituted a threat to the water quality of the Wolf River and its subsidiaries. The environmental impact of the project accelerated the dialogue phase as according to Deborah McNutt, protesters and Ojibwe spearfishers agreed that, and I quote, mining was an overriding problem and started to create some almost unexpected common grounds at the height of potential violence. In 1988, Walt Bressett, a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe and a prominent figure of the Ojibwe environmentalist movement, told the Wisconsin State Journal, Sooner or later, people in northern Wisconsin will realize that the environmental threat is more of a threat to their lifestyle than Indians who go out and spearfish. I think, in fact, that we have more things in common with the anti-Indian people than we have with the state of Wisconsin." End quote. 
His statements foreshadowed the gradual shift that occurred in the 90s thanks to his work with the emergence of native and na native non-native alliances in rural Wisconsin. As a response to growing anti-treaty sentiments throughout the country, grassroots organizations had emerged to campaign for the protection of indigenous treaty rights. And in Wisconsin, these organizations gathered under the Midwest Treaty Network that worked to protect Ojibwe treaty rights. The MTN formed the Witness for Nonviolence Group to protect Ojibwe spare fishers and record race-based violence during the boat landings. With the introduction of the mining issue and the threat it represented for reserved rights, MTN joined forces with the Niwin Tribes organization that gathered the four tribes most impacted by the Crandon project along the Wolf River. Together, they formed the Wolf Watershed Educational Project. When Exxon, who had abandoned its, fir its first permit in 1986, reapplied for a sulfide metallic permit in 1992, WWEP organized speaking tours and educational programs to raise awareness among rural communities on the dangers of metallic mining, but also on the importance of treaty rights. The organization gathered tribe members, scholars, scientists, environmental activists, and some of the first sport fishers who had understood the necessity of collaboration to oppose Exxon. Three elderly white sport fishers took the stand during the tours despite their differing political beliefs and social and economic backgrounds. Their involvement in the speaking tours was pivotal as they allowed white rural residents to relate to WWEP. Their dedication to protecting their shared environment convinced more and more Wisconsinites to join their campaigns to stop the Crandon mine, with one sport fisher telling the Milwaukee Sentinel regarding the mining public hearings, not once did I see anyone testify who represented protect Americans' rights and resources or stop treaty abuse. The Indians were always there. By creating these unprecedented opportunities for dialogue, WWEP led to the fourth stage outlined by Grossman where collaboration becomes possible. Having successfully raised awareness around the issue of mining and treaty rights, WWEP and the subsequent alliances that had emerged in the region against the Crandon Project campaigned for legislative change. The community had entered into the fourth stage, rural, native, non-native environmental alliances, and they demanded from the state to mirror the changes they had enacted within their community to protect the natural resources that had brought them together. WWEP campaigned for the sulfine mining moratorium in Wisconsin, and the bill, also known as the Privet First Bill, required mining companies to prove when applying for a metallic mining permit that a similar project had been operated for 10 years and closed for 10 years without any contamination and pollution from acid mine drainage. In 1997, the bill was adopted with the support of the majority of rural Wisconsin as it created an additional safeguard to environmental protection. With the help of WWEP and the support of local communities, the Socalgon Mole Lake petitioned the EPA to gain authority over water regulations, and in 1995, they became the first Wisconsin tribe to be granted by the EPA the authority to regulate water quality on their reservation. During the public hearings on their application with the federal agency, WWEP representatives, lakes associations, and local citizens showed their support for the tribe, demonstrating the changes in the relations between white Wisconsinites and Native American tribes in the region. On October 28, 2003, the Forest County Potawatomi and the Socalgon Mole Lake tribes paid BHP Billiton, who had taken over Exxon's Crandon Mine Project, $16.5 million for the mine site. The price of the mine had significantly, significantly dropped due to lack of interest from investors who had become aware of the growing anti-mining movement in the region. The fourth stage had effectively led to one of the largest companies in the world having to abandon a multi-million project due to communi community-based alliances. But above all, the fourth stage had reversed the perception of white rural communities when it comes to Ojibwe reserved rights. When we go back to the conflict stage, reserved rights were seen as special grants from the federal government. They were perceived as unfair, unequal, and even dangerous for the environment. But with the arrival of Exxon and the threat of metallic mining in the region, Ojibwe reserved rights, which implied the protection of the resources they hunt, fish, and gather on ceded territory, reserved rights had become a tool for environmental protection. Anti-mining activist Sandy Leon told Grossman in an interview that when Ojibwe tribes entered the anti-mining movement, it was like, and I quote, the cavalry had arrived. 
the impact of the Crandon mine opposition on rural grassroots environmental movements in Wisconsin can be noted when looking at more recent projects like the GTAC mine, for example. The native-non-native -native alliances and the creation of this sense of belonging and place membership created a model for GTAC opponents that gathered Bad River tribe members and Ashland, Bayfield and Washburn residents. Located on the Pinocchio Hills, the project threatened the quality of the water that flows through the Bad River Reservation and into Lake Superior and threatened Ashland and nearby, nearby towns drinking water. I think I'm going to go over the 20 minutes line. But <laughs> Um, opposition quickly mobilized and the movement skipped over the conflict phase and immediately saw the collaboration of rural communities and Ojibwe tribes who understood the urgency of the threat. Following in the steps of the Mole Lake, the Bad River tribe petitioned the EPA for regulatory authority under the, the Clean Water Act to enforce tribal water quality standards. And on June 9th, 2011, environmental activists and organizations gathered at the Sigurd, Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute at Northland College to organize the, the Pinocchio Hills educational project modeled after WWEP. The mayors of the three communities downstream from the mine in Bayfield, Washburn and Ashland all testified at a public hearing session regarding the passage of the iron mining bill that GTAC was pushing for to bypass the moratorium bill, expressing their concern regarding the water quality, with Bayfield mayor saying, and I quote, the overriding thought on any economic development in the Bayfield area is do no harm to Lake Superior. You put one drop of, of pollutant in there and it takes 192 years to get out of there. Collectively, we are afraid. The use of the word collective here further illustrates the cooperation in the entire mining movement that no longer excludes one group for the benefit of the other, but includes every community that shares similar values and attachment to the water of Lake Superior. During a press conference, Bill Whalen, Ashland's mayor said, and I quote, this is not a native sovereign issue versus the state of Wisconsin. This is a water legislative issue that affects us all. Showing the importance of water as a culturally significant object for both native and non-native residents in rural Wisconsin. In solidarity with the Bat River, the La Courtoreille established the LCO's Harvest and Educational Camp on public forest land in the Pinocchio Hills, where they have reserved hunting, fishing and gathering rights. In addition to showing a united front against the proposed mine, the establishment of the camp on ceded territory also gave the tribes a legal argument if they were to go to court against GTAC. In 2015, GTAC withdrew its permit application, citing unexpected extensive wetlands, despite Glyphwick experts having warned the company of the wetlands since the beginning of the project. During a celebratory ceremony, Bad River Elder Joe Rose stated, and I quote, we need to give thanks that our prayers were answers. This demonstrates the effectiveness of ceremonies, prayers, and grassroots activism. In a state where natural resources seem to shape people's sense of identity, which is even illustrated in the flag of Wisconsin that represents a fisher and a miner carrying the shield, place membership that emerges from conflict can offer an answer or an alternative to an otherwise complex relationship between citizens who, as individuals, share status as citizens of the state, but as a group belong to different nations. In northern Wisconsin, the growing demands from the mining industry resulted in rural communities feeling marginalized and left out of the conversation between decision-making decision -making agencies and mining corporations, which eventually led them to relate to their native neighbors in their struggle for sovereignty. Through their shared sense of belonging and attachment to the natural resources that played a pivotal role in how they perceived their identity, the two groups were able to overcome decades of conflict to create a united front against mining projects. Projects. Mining companies were seen as outsiders, which allowed the two communities to imagine themselves as insiders, sharing a common goal and a common place, which eventually facilitated the transition from conflict to cooperation. Although the assertion of tribal sovereignty initially further divided the state based on race, in the long run, the assertion allowed white rural communities to begin to see treaty rights as a tool that was beneficial to the tribe, but also beneficial to them, which goes back to the idea that place membership could be a more inclusive alternative to state citizenship as it accounts for the diversity of the people that compose the group. I'm going to conclude, I think. 
to conclude this presentation and maybe open the discussion to your thoughts on place membership and environmental alliances in rural areas, I think it would have been necessary to bring some nuance to the situation. Of course, place membership is not an all-encompassing answer to citizenship, environmentalism, and mining issues in settler colonial societies, and anti-Indian sentiments didn't magically disappear in northern Wisconsin, but I don't have enough time to talk about the obstacles to place membership and the influence of politics and the role of the DNR in the protests and recent developments that seem to indicate steps backwards in the relations between the communities, but maybe we can discuss all these topics during the Q&A here. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent.